And it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the band. Saving his voice for uh, the beacon. Yeah. So can we get a show of hands for who all is going to the beacon show on Saturday? Yeah. Oh, no. oh, this, this is amazing. I'm moderating some of these Q and A's here at IFC, and I've never seen people rise to their feet. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, listen, we appreciate your support. You know we do. So I guess let's start with the genesis of the project. I mean, sit down now. <laughs> I'm going to get to audience questions in a couple minutes, but uh, let's start with how this all came to be. Well, I think in 2009, when we were out on tour, and, you know, when we first got back together, um, we used to play a song in the set called Round and Round, and uh, behind us we, we would pin together a certain amount of old footage that we had from different people's super cameras and video cameras from the old days, and that went down really well. And uh, Steve Dagger, who I think uh, we owe a lot of credit to for the movie, uh, the band's manager, said, why don't we extend that and make that, turn that into a full movie? And we should just put together, you know, if any, anybody, we find out, first of all, find out what we had. Yeah. You know, we, we all thought we, we didn't have enough footage. But in the end, we had something like 450 hours of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, it was really Steve's idea to put the film together. It was a story that needed that, that really no one had really covered. I mean, the old, yeah. what became the new romantic movement. Um, you know, no one, people were kind of avoiding it for some reason. Don't know why. People are embracing it now, all over the place. We're on tour, and you see like young kids have suddenly seen pictures and they're thinking, "Wow, that looks exciting! Wow, that's dangerous!" And then we see, we don't just see. Uh, the, the, the people that were coming to our gigs years ago, we're seeing a fresh audience. Old people, he means. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and there's obviously, you know, it was like, okay, now's the time. And Steve spotted that, and, um, you know, and, and, and I think it's just, it's, it's got legs. Yeah, I think, you know, we had a three-act story that if you were to write a fictitious film about a band, you would probably write it in a similar fashion, you know, rags to riches and... No one would believe that, girl. <laughs> and, then, and then beating each other up and then redemption at the end, I think, you know. Um, the, the most uh, important factor in making this was finding this brilliant director, George Henkin. She was, you know, completely in control of finding this story out of all those hours of archive. Um, the the fact that you know Steve wanted to make it in the first place and and uh, and got someone on the case of finding all that footage, but you know George was really us stepping back and saying and letting her allowing her to find the through line uh, out of all of that material, which was actually the story that she picked up on was the story of a bunch of guys that grew up together that formed a very close relationship with. We we were friends that fell out and then found each other. I've got to tell you, it was like very, very expensive therapy. I know in the States you <laughs> have a lot of therapy. Well, we went through it too. Hours and hours and bloody hours of talking to George Henkin. And i got to say that um, we allowed her to tell her story from our interpretation of what it's like to be in Spandau Ballet and to break up and get back together again. Um, what we didn't do was get involved in the editing and stuff because then it would have just been a, another sanitized version of a rock band, hey, aren't we great and everything. And uh, so I think we've been very, very honest. Whether you're a Spandau Ballet fan or not, I think you can see, oh wow, there's lots of history there and there's a story about the band as well, which is emotional. So I think, it, I think it also is a story that relates to everybody here. You know, we've all had friends that have broken up with and got back together or relationships that have fought broken apart and we've brought back together and we know how uh, precious those relationships are. And that's our story and that's the story we watch tonight. Some people were actually he, he, it's, Steve it's, Jones. He's got about ten questions. No, we're getting our questions. <laughs> <laughs> we're just giving you answers. For the you Steve, see what we have There's to do a few Blitz kids here. Where's Steve Jones? Is he here? Right, right. Hello, hey, Steve. 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 Ste
Stephen the Great Milner, who's got an exhibition coming up, haven't you? Where? Oh, only at the Metropolitan. <laughs> you know, it's a story of your life, Steve, isn't it, as well, don't you think? Yeah, it's very much. Still living the dream. Well, about the therapy aspect, I'm curious, were any of you nervous about unearthing the bad blood? I actually it's was after I'd done it, I have to say, because when George interviewed all of us individually, and we never actually, until just over a year ago, got to see the film together. And I remember so we were all in the line together and then there's all this stuff that we hadn't seen yet. It's like, oh my God, you know, squirming away. We were. Uh, but I remember when I said, said my bits and, um, and I said to George afterwards, okay, I've got it on my, off my chest, but I'm a little a bit worried about that. I don't want to sort of open up any wounds and stuff. And, I, you know, she said, no, you, that's staying in there. That, that is the nitty gritty. That's the heart and soul of the film. Yeah, there's a great bit where Steve says um, at the end of the film, you know, that kind of that bad stuff, we just sort of, put it in a box and we leave it. No, we don't. We make a movie about it. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been a very big box. It's only. Did watching it all together kind of bring you closer together in a way? Oh, I think yeah. it has, absolutely. I, I mean, not just making a movie, but every time we sit down in front of an interviewer and talk about it, it's like Tony said, it's therapy. Yeah. You know, we, talk, we, we do what everybody says they should do, and that's talk about it, which yeah. uh, I think has brought us closer together, yeah. Now you've toured the world as a band, but touring the world with this film, you know, you know as, as subjects of a documentary, you've been at South by Southwest, you are at the Rome Film Festival, um, what's that experience been like? How, how would you compare the experience of touring a film festival as, you know, as opposed to touring um, to music? It's, it's been fantastic actually, I mean, it, you know, the, the music business is very different to what it was years ago, you used to release the album and then you, you tour with the album. Uh, we did it slightly differently. <laughs> we decided to make a film instead. Uh, but, and then the record company obviously said, oh, we want to do a Greatest Hits and we need some new songs as well. So we pinned three new songs on the Greatest Hits album um, with Trevor Horn, um, who we last worked with on the Instinction. Um, it, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, I've got to say one of the highlights for me, and probably for all of us, at the Royal Albert Hall in London, we had the premiere. And it's our, it was our own red carpet, and it was like amazing. And we played a, uh, we played a bit of a gig afterwards, and, and it was just fantastic. So to have a documentary made about your life, not many people get that in their lives. So we're, we're, we're lucky boys, lucky boys. Uh, yeah, but also the fact that it highlighted such a wonderful creative period. Uh, and, that, you know, it's been looked on, and this is, I think this is factual, some people laughed at that period. You know, how, how stupid we looked or whatever. You know, they're looking back in it differently now. They're looking back, they, that doesn't exist now. Mm -hmm. Kids look back on it now and they go, oh, it must have been great to have grown mm -hmm. up in that time. Because look at you lot, you could do what the hell you wanted. Yeah. And we did. And, we, and when, we were in the, when we were in the Blitz and we were in Billy's, you know, we'd all chat and we'd get off our faces. And, you know, everyone does, you know, they, they, they put the world to rights. Next day, they hang over, nothing gets done. <laughs> the difference being, that what we did do, we did things. We did stuff we talked about. We, we were the band, we were musical, Stephen Jones over there, uh, forced his own path, everyone had it. And, and it just, there was so much confidence going on. Hotbed of creativity. Most people, Steve, were getting just pissed. <laughs> Ooh, absolutely. <laughs> that was the difference. Talk, talk is cheap, but you know, we're still living the dream. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, all coming up into that time, you know, they didn't have the internet back then. How do you think you would have coped had something like that. I don't, I don't think it could have existed really in the same way because you know we sort of thrived on on mystique. You know yeah. we uh, we were actually called elitist at the time because people wouldn't weren't allowed into the gigs. But that was because they were full. You know, so they couldn't get in anymore. But um, you know we kept journalists back and we we didn't allow record companies to hear our uh, music and we didn't send them tapes. You know, and I think a lot of what was going on was a kind of tribal elitism but then all youth cultures like that but you know if it was today someone would have filmed our first gig at the blitz and put it on youtube and written bollocks underneath <laughs> it would have been over at the end of it so um, you know we, we could also you could also make uh, uh, you know not so much musical talent go a long way with a lot of good talk you can only deal with what's in front of you you know you can only live in your era uh, obviously the live music Era, you know, the live music arena is uh, is a, has been a constant. Yeah, the way music is delivered and 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 you know people people take music from the internet and stuff. But you know, the live arena really just gets down to basics, really. Yeah. 
We're going to open it up to you folks. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand and I'll point in your direction. So yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt. Yes, there are. Yeah, um, through the barricades, uh, I wrote that um, as you see on the film from a, an Irish uh, influence. Um, yeah, it was a Romeo and Juliet story about Protestant Catholic couple coming together. Uh, I wrote it in Ireland. Um, it was very much about that place. The only hint of that, though, is uh, is the mention of the Yeats uh, line, "A terrible beauty." Um, but when we did it, when we did it in Berlin, in, in at the end of the eighties, we played in Berlin um, when the war was coming down, and it was became about them. It's now about us, you know. After the way George presented it in the film, when we were doing the shows as arena shows in Europe. Uh, we, we had a clip of us falling apart and getting back together again at the end, and then we'd begin Through the Barricades. Forevermore now, Through the Barricades is about our story. So, um, yeah, that one has. Yeah? On behalf of everybody, I'm glad that you guys have really worked through everything and have come back to us, because it's fantastic. Yeah! yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is for Martin. After going through all of this and seeing the bad side and the good side, your son's in a band. How often do you find yourself holding back from trying to tell him, don't go this way, do this, or, or do you yeah. give him a lot of it? <laughs> <laughs> to, to my own children. Well, your son's band. Oh, my son's band. Yeah. My, 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 my son's band has finished. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Finished. my son is doing other things, but he's involved in entertainment as well so your question is still relevant and uh, of course you try and give them as much ex of your life experience as you can mm -hmm. you know um, but you also have to let them go their own way that's uh, if you don't they will ever forever come back at you can, can I just tag on the end of that one my son's in a band and, uh, and I'm saying Jack really do get a proper job he's also a model and I'm like okay look listen seriously and, uh, and now he's saying dad I really fancy taking up acting up that's it <laughs> so, no more advice the gentleman in the front row hi good evening uh, throughout Hello. your career was there ever a project that you guys worked on when you never saw the day of life a great project that you worked on uh, there was one project that we worked on that never saw the day of life, but I don't think it should have done. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, he's kidding. Um, you know, not really. We've been really lucky. You know, we've. Uh, and I suppose you know you always have ambitions to go further all the time. That never ever, you know, make, you're always setting yourself new goals. We were going to do. A, we were going to do our, our third album was going to be all uh, recorded with Trevor Horn. And it was going to be called The Pleasure Project, and um, it didn't work out with Trevor. Um, and luckily, we did it with someone else, and it was a huge hit, so it didn't matter. No, we have no regrets, really. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's very important. Pretty much everything we've done has got to you people. You know, as an artist, what you want to do is get your art to as many people as possible, and hopefully, they like it. Hey, how was Live Aid, performing at Live Aid, different from, I mean, you've performed in so many other places. How was, how was it different, or emotionally, how did it feel? Um, it was just an amazing day. I mean, you know, to, to be there at Wembley Stadium with 80-odd thousand people, Sunny Day, Prince Charles, Princess Di, all your contemporaries and all your heroes backstage, uh, and knowing that you were doing something that was changing the way people viewed charity uh, and, and the way that, that, you know, because, you know, uh, music, the music business, you know, as, as we said, get a proper job. But here we were as a bunch of musicians and artists that were actually making a difference and highlighting a terrible, um, a terrible famine that was going on in Ethiopia. And um, so, you know, it, all in all, it was an amazing, amazing Man, experience. more importantly, we're on a bill with Queen and Bowie <laughs> and The Who. I mean, what's not to like? Do you know, it's, it was a great leveller. Can you imagine? It, this is like the, the most scary X Factor audition in the world, isn't it? You know, you, you're being that's judged by everyone else. Also, you know, it was, it was kind of like, that's when it all changed because 
you know, you had politicians and Geldof, bless him, because he was the one who had the front to, to go up to politicians and say, so, Mrs. Thatcher, what are you going to do about the tax on this? And she gave, she gave up this whole, sorry, fanny, about, about <laughs> what, you know, oh, we, we have, everybody has to, you know, we have to pay the tax. No, but, you know, we're saving people's lives here. They couldn't do anything about it. But it, put, it, it took the power out of their hands and, and into the musicians, really. And, th and that was kind of like, okay, it really works. There's a huge power with music, not just emotionally, but actually it gets things done. Yeah, I mean, like, no, that's what George has done well in the film. You know, she's, uh, she's shown all those great sea changes that went on in the 80s and how um, people power went on as well. You know, not only with the beginning of cable television and globalization and this sense of all being united, but you know, the Berlin Wall coming down, apartheid, and, uh, and of course with Live Aid, suddenly people thought, well, you know what, I'm more powerful than a cross in a box every four or five years. I watched it on YouTube. <laughs> you know what was funny about you, you, that day? You weren't born then, probably. <laughs> what was funny about that day is sometimes, uh, you know, you only realize that you've kind of been in this historical moment in retrospect really but that particular day we all knew that we were making something that was history do you know what funny enough though we knew that about the blitz club didn't we Stephen? i mean we were true, yeah. noticed, but we just felt there was a buzz because even though there were only about 50 people in the room there was a sort of critical mass there was an energy it we were like invincible it was like putting a load of creatives in a room and saying design the next decade you know <laughs> and and there were literally people outside the blitz you know, trying to sign people up for, you know, as, as being, you know, creatives in advertising companies, etc. Thanks. Uh, we have a question right up uh, near the back. Yeah. All right. So thanks, thanks, guys. Um, but one of the threads that keeps coming up in the film is that you're working class lads. Um, can you talk about that, how proud you are of that, and also to what extent is that possible today for pop stars? And finally, did I see Peter Capaldi in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is our only ever support act. Pete is to go on and cover himself in flour and be quite funny for 20 minutes. Um, but I, I being working class is just what we were born into. You know, it was our reality. Um, we knew no different. I think. I mean, I, I, th I said in the film that that um, I mean, our parents were kids during the war and stuff like that, and we were the sort of first generation really that that they felt that we could do anything we wanted, go to grammar school you know, create anything, you know, my parents always said to me, and I think our parents to all of us said, you can do anything you want to do in life. And that was never necessarily the same before that. It was like you went into the, whether it was mines or whatever it might be. But we, uh, we had a, an incredible optimism in our generation. And I think we owe our parents say, a lot for that, mate. Yeah. I mean, I hate the class system. I think it sucks, whether it's working class, middle class or upper class. But, um, but at least we had the opportunity to do something with our lives and, um, and, and in some ways it's less of a reality today than it was even back then, sadly. Yeah? It was very brave of you to take, uh, do they know it's Christmas, the first take. Who went after you? And I can really still hear you on that. <laughs> you know, I was so bloody nervous. I couldn't <laughs> yeah, he was in the toilet after that saying, so didn't <laughs> <laughs> in the toilet it was there, it's quite no. Anyway, hey, so, yeah, so, yeah. It, it was. I tell you, it wasn't. It wasn't by George because at the time he was in New York, and uh, and Geldof said, "You gotta come. You've gotta fucking get your ass over here." <laughs> he said, he said get your ass. So he flew over and arrived just in time. Yeah, he got concord. Yeah, he got concord over. And, Lead the world, uh, and, get and concord. To be Brilliant. <laughs> 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 Fashion was a big part of your beginning, avant-garde and gentry, you know, all that stuff. Do you miss those outfits? Did you have a favorite? No. God tell you, love, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're always really proud of what we did, you know. It's also, it was of its time as well. You know, if you were saying, we were saying to walk in there looking like, I don't know, Robin Hood or whatever. It was never intended. It didn't look like Robin Hood, but you know. Yes, you things. did. No, you know, we're always very proud of that stuff. There's no shame in it. And it, at the time, it was shocking. You know, I can remember getting, like, coming back in the morning from my girlfriend's house, wearing a kilt on the tube. You know, it's just like eight, nine o'clock in the morning, people are going to work and they're looking, they're looking, I'm going, yeah, come on. <laughs> that's what it's about. It's like, yes, that's exactly what you should be doing. You know, I'm still obsessed with clothes, I have to say. There's, no, there's never changed for me. But um, 
Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm obsessed with what young people are wearing, and I'm still really disappointed <laughs> that no one isn't looking very exciting and wild anymore. You know, I'd like to be walking through the streets of Soho, and a gang comes around the corner in stovepipe hats or something mad, you know? And except now it's not. Everyone's, because I think people can dress up their Facebook page, can put stuff on Instagram, you know, they can express themselves in different ways, and they don't, need, they don't even need place. You see, you know, we were centered around a club, and, and the history of youth culture and pop culture has always been about certain places, the, you know, the Marquee or the UFO Club or whatever it might be. And Two Eyes, this is all in London, obviously. And, uh, and now you don't need place because you can find your tribes by staying at home. We unfortunately only have time for one more, so we'll take it from the front row. That's a good idea. I'll ask you a question. Oh, well, you have a gift. You have a what? Oh. Even better, even better. <laughs> she said she has a gift. One more, this young lady there. Yeah. Security. <laughs> can, you, can you drink it, I was going to say. Yeah. Um, no, you can't. Right, sure. Oh, yeah. well, I, I thought it thank was you, fun. thank you very much. Oh. Me, 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 thank you. Is it a skirt? She designed it. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Where are you from? Where are you from? Italy. Oh, grazie mille, grazie mille. <laughs> First kiss through the barricades. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. What a review! <laughs> Care in the community, I called it. Thank you very much. And is there a hat for us, Stephen, or not? <laughs> Did you see Tony was wearing your hat in the Musclebound video on the screen? One of your early creations. Oh, come. I'm being dressed now. <laughs> Okay, so while she dresses him, why don't we get one last question? Yeah, well, she dresses him. <laughs> yeah. Stand up. Oh. Oh, very nice. Okay, go ahead. Suit you, sir. Oh, okay. You have a question, right? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can remember. With everything that you guys have been through in all these years and the ups and downs Thank you. and sorry, touring sorry, and sorry, fashion, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can we stand up so they can hear. Go ahead. Sorry, just yell your question. I can repeat it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your camera down. Um, oh, my hands are shaking. With all the ups and downs that you guys have been through and, you know, the generations with style, fashion, and everything like that, how do you feel that towards touring now, uh, is it more fun for you guys? Is it more stressful? It's exactly because, like that. It's exactly that. Because, uh, because you have got families, it all... is it harder? Is it actually maybe more fun? Or? Yeah, it's more fun now because we don't have any issues. And also, we're not, it's, when we... You know, when we were together and we were releasing singles, you know, it's always you're always looking over your shoulder. There's always a new band coming up, as we did once. We were we had bands in the early '80s looking over their shoulders as we crept up, going like that, we're coming. And that, and you know, we, that, and that was happening to us as well. Remember, so we don't we don't have that anymore. We don't have to worry about deadlines as long as we get up in the morning at, at the right time and down in the lobby. Well, that's why you're late. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the one thing that hasn't really changed in terms of you know it's pretty simple we plug in i've got a microphone we play we're a very i hate to use this cliche word organic band we don't use trickery or anything else so in effect it hasn't really changed since we were young kids and and, and what we love more than anything is playing live that is the best Woo! best thing better than anything else and I think we, we're much better musicians than we were, even though that we were very good oh, at the beginning, okay. but we're better than we <laughs> bring on the bacon. Bringing myself up, yes. <laughs> you choose, you choose. Well, he's involved for certain, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he's, he's a visionary. Yeah. Fisherman. Sorry, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Thank <laughs> you.